Freedom. I'm Mia Hunt, editor of Global Government Forum, the publishing house serving civil servants around the world. Welcome to today's webinar, Building the Right Systems for Remote Working, which is run in association with Dell Technologies, whose support allows us to offer this webinar free to public servants. Over recent months, millions of civil servants have been learning how to work effectively from home, developing the skills and techniques to operate in a distributed workforce. Now, with COVID-19 likely to remain a threat for months to come, civil service organisations are focusing on improving the remote working experience, in part through providing the right technologies and equipment to improve efficiency, security and staff wellbeing. We have three panellists today. Ian Matthews, Human Resources Director at Arts Council England. Lee Larter, UK Networking Director at Dell Technologies. And Terry Makewell, Chief Technology Officer at the UK Hydrographic Office. Ian will focus on the human side of transitioning hundreds of employees to working remotely, covering what Arts Council England is doing to keep staff engaged, relieve tensions in the workforce and promote wellbeing. Lee will talk us through some of the key trends he and Dell have seen in the six months since lockdown began, and we'll run through some of the equipment and technologies needed to support morale and to ensure organisational security and efficiency. And Terry will cover both sides, explaining what the UK Hydrographic Office has done both on the technology front and in supporting people's wellbeing. The webinar will begin with short presentations from the panellists and then we'll move on to the Q&A session. Uh, we set aside a good chunk of time to answer your questions, so please do click on the Q&A box at the foot of the Zoom window and type any questions you have in there, and we'll get through as many as we can at the end after the three presentations. Uh, just a little warning that I have a bit of a cold, so if I briefly disappear off screen, that's to save you from seeing me sneeze. Um, all right, that's all from me for now. We'll go now to our first presentation from Ian Matthews. Ian. Are you there, Ian? Ian may be having some trouble with his connection. Just give him a little bit more time. And if he's continuing to have problems, we may have to move on to one of the other panelists and have someone else go first. Lee, I wonder whether we could try going on to you and then we can go back to Ian when he manages to connect. Absolutely. So did you want to share the slides? Okay, we'll kick off um, and we'll come back to Ian, who's going to be talking more about the human side of the work from home um, once he joins. Um, and some of the technologies I'll talk through at the moment, we'll, uh, we'll look at how we can mitigate against some of the connection issues that we're all facing when we're having to work um, remotely in during this unprecedented time. So if we move on to the uh, first slide, please, Mia. So before we kick off, just really want to acknowledge that we are all really facing an unprecedented moment in history. Um, and as Dell Technologies, we believe that an enabling a remote workforce in this climate is one important way that we can help keep employees, communities and our customers and partners safe. Uh, today at Dell Technologies, we are supporting more than 100,000 of our global employees, about 120,000 to work remotely. Um, and this is a rapid scale up of our existing remote workforce program that we've been doing uh, for years now. Uh, we have had a uh, work from home in a number of our global locations and in the UK for a number of our staff. So we understand many of the challenges that our customers are going through enabling a remote work, especially if they've not been doing it for years. 
So on that note, we're here to offer you some of our know-how uh, in terms of how we've implemented our connected workplace and how we can help and work with you to collaborate uh, in order to do the same. So if you want to move on to the, the next slide, please. Mia, thank you. So as much as um, Ian will talk about the human side and the employee being the first and foremost priority in terms of keeping all of our employees, our staff, our customers safe during these times. Um, it's not only the employee and the HR side, which Ian will come on to talk about when he rejoins, um, that we need to make uh, ensure for good experience for employees as they will, uh, work remotely. There's a whole ecosystem of devices, applications, infrastructure, uh, networking that must all be scaled and adjusted to ensure a successful remote work program. Um, so these at high level, various systems that you see on the screen uh, are areas that we feel need to be addressed in order to successfully enable um, remote workers. So you may already have solved some of these challenges today. Um, we're not here to tell you otherwise, but we want to focus our conversation around these specific areas. And if you want to collaborate or talk to Dell Technologies around how we can help, we'd love to set up um, bespoke workshops with, with yourselves. So from the left, starting with the end user, just as we went over, making sure, sure or as it, Ian will go over, that they have the right, um, the right ecosystem um, to work from home. We need to make sure that they've got the right device, the right software, the right settings, and in some cases, this may mean corporately owned physical devices, uh, perhaps a corporately managed virtual desktop experience or some combination of the two. Um, it's a question of cost, security and performance requirements that we need to enable for our remote staff. Uh, we also need to make sure we're ensuring secure connectivity. So this may depend on the nature of the data, the type of applications and the specific industry or sub government industry that you're working in, um, whether you need um, secure virtual private network access and full encryption for highly prioritized uh, network traffic, or um, if your employees can do their work remotely and simply sign into a web portal. Regardless, the question of how workers connect to the network and to systems is important. And as we go towards a data center where um, your applications are residing to serve your customers um, and your staff, we have to answer the question of the networking infrastructure. And this is a challenge we at Dow. Um, had to, had to address when we rapidly scaled the number of employees working remotely um, and making sure we've got the right infrastructure and sufficient network infrastructure to handle massive increase in traffic um, to the corporate network. And even more critical, if you're running virtualized applications or desktops that are streaming to you as an end user, we need to make sure a, a good level of performance. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please, um, Mia. So, uh, Really, in terms of asking some of the challenges and what were the challenges that we saw our customers trying to solve quickly in order to keep the businesses running and are continuing to address today across the ecosystem, really first it was how do we get the majority of our people productive as soon as possible, delivering them the right applications to where they need them at the right time. And this is a question of triage. How do we address the needs of largest volumes of users as quickly as possible? Um, do most users need specialty software with high-end workstations and performance characteristics, or can we solve for 80% and have a separate strategy for that 20% of high-performance workers? Second is how we address those more critical workers that do have uh, additional access or security or uh, performance requirements. Maybe they're clinicians working against high-definition um, images at home or financial traders um, having to do real-time applications. So we need to look at different ways for different parts of the industry to solve those performance and security challenges. Um, next is then making sure that um, we're able to help our customers extend or even heighten their security profile to the, the endpoints, which are now outside of the place of work or outside of the traditional network. So with increased endpoints um, outside of this corporate network, the attack surface grows exponentially. Um, so in order to minimize vulnerabilities um, for the organization's data assets, we have to look at centralized management. But we see many customers applying additional layers of security that weren't necessary when devices were regularly inside the corporate network. Um, 
The fourth point here is really talking to how do I ensure that those critical workers get the network performance that they require to do their jobs productively. And um, we don't want to have um, intermittent technology issues um, such as unfortunately Ian's just seen, seen this morning, preventing maybe a business critical or mission critical application or, or meeting. Um, so if we have certain um, staff or certain workers with certain applications, how do we make sure that we get the right performance to the right users at the right time? Um, and we're building and rolling out technologies across our own staff and working with our customers to address that. And lastly, um, but certainly no, no, no least, what we see as the challenge in enabling the core IT infrastructure um, to handle the demand of all of this remote connectivity. So, and making sure that our IT personnel and staff are, are, are scaled in order to maybe service some of these requirements in much more of a, uh, a remote fashion. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please, um, Mia. So from a Dell Technologies perspective, here's how we're presenting some of our solutions to help address some of those questions or challenges that we've just spoken to. Um, so first of all, uh, making sure employees get the right device they need for their jobs, preloaded with the applications they need and shipped directly to them. We've managed, all managed centrally through Workspace ONE. We then want to make sure we give those critical workers the extra access they need to hardware resources with direct secure access to the right data they need through streaming virtual applications and desktops directly from the data center through a virtual um, desktop infrastructure. We need to make sure we secure the endpoint devices with next generation intrinsic security built into everything that we're doing. And that's what we're doing with the Dell Technologies Carbon Black solution. And then we want to bold stuff the edge access devices um, with software defined wide area networking which enables us to extend the corporate network to either a remote office or in this case the home office um, and these edge appliances can be distributed to any home office location in a very um, efficient manner but all managed centrally in a very secure ecosystem and lastly solving um, helping solve customers challenges of scaling IT um, through the Dell Technologies Cloud Solution, providing an ease of deployment of resources with a single, single consistent management view across all of the various cloud deployments, regardless of whether they're on-premise or leveraging the public cloud, be it Amazon, Microsoft, or any of the other public cloud providers. So if we just go, click through to the next slide, please, Mia, um, and just, just really then looking at how we start breaking this down to different types of technologies, and we say follow the wire. So, um, ultimately, we have our end users sitting in their remote office on their chosen devices or infrastructure. Um, we then make sure that they've got the right connectivity to connect to their corporate assets that may be done in a virtual environment. So this is where we talk about what we have in terms of virtual desktop infrastructure, essentially just referring to a strategy of running a PC environment virtually in the cloud or in, um, in your own data centers streaming that desktop to the remote user. Um, and this approach is often preferred when the data and application must remain secure behind the corporate, um, behind the corporate walls or the firewall as we call it. Um, users require hardware or when users require hardware resources not available on those mobile devices. Um, and then the software defined wide area networking technology is a virtual networking technology that allows our customers to use a number of services securely, connect users to applications, prioritize traffic, and make sure that we have the right service level um, for the right applications, the right users at the right time um, to prevent some of the, um, the issues that we see in terms of, um, terms of application service level agreements um, and making sure if the when the children come home from school and turn on Netflix or uh, their PlayStation cloud games, it doesn't interrupt with those business critical applications that we're running. Um, and the Dell EMC SD-WAN solution, powered by VMware, provides significant value for our customers, allowing them to adapt to this change, improve availability and save money over um, traditional methods. Uh, this is enabling our customers to confidently run 
critical workloads across inexpensive broadband connections or home broadband connections that may otherwise prove unreliable. Um, and as an example, if we click onto the next slide, I'm not sure if any of you are sit sat on an unreliable link at the moment um, in terms of, um, next slide please Mia, in terms of having an interrupted um, access to the, the Zoom stream today. But what we want to ensure is, and we're on the next slide please Mia, that we're not having the, the pixelated view um, when somebody turns on um, Netflix or somebody downloads the latest version of Fortnite or whatever the gaming application may be in their home, and we can give the right priorities to those business critical applications, be it um, a clinician working from home from a radiography perspective, or be it any um, other mission critical home, home worker. So by introducing an additional device into the um, the home working environment so we go to the next slide into the after approach we essentially get the ability to um, to augment the connectivity that we have in our home office maybe through adding um, some mobile technologies through LTE like you have in your mobile phone so as well as the BT or Vodafone or whatever your um, Sky or Virgin broadband connection is we can have a redundant or high availability connection into the home office or the remote office um, and then we can start prioritizing those business critical applications so um, we don't have uh, an uninterrupted work environment for our customers um, or our staff as they're accessing their, their business critical applications. So if you would like to talk to us more about these technologies, um, please do get in touch um, following the event. We'll give you our contact details. Uh, we'll have happily talk around how we can leverage any of these technologies from a connectivity or security perspective um, for your organizations. Um, and we will be talking a lot more about this at Dell Technologies World on the 21st and 22nd of October um, and a number of sessions to walk through these technologies. Um, so with that, um, that's, that's the introduction done from a Dell Technologies perspective. Um, and if Ian's managed to get back online, we'll hand over to him to talk around some of the um, the human side of the, the impact as we remove, move to this remote working environment. So, Ian, over to you. Hi, Lee, um, um, and everybody else. Uh, just double checking, can everyone uh, hear me and see me okay? Yeah. Uh, apolo apologies for the uh, loss of service earlier, at exactly the wrong moment, having been sitting there with the team for the previous half hour in perfect communication. Um, I, I'll point out at the start, for Lee's sake, we are not a Dell user where I work, so I'm not going to blame them. Possibly everything to do with um, trying to use what is software I, we don't use in my organization, Zoom, um, and trying to do new things at the wrong time uh, on a possibly occasionally, especially in the mornings when it rains in Manchester, unstable home network. But I'm not going to talk much about the um, IT side of things. I'm not an IT director, I'm the HR director of Arts Council England and I've been asked to come here and talk about kind of more our well-being engagement um, staff side of things uh, during the lockdown phase. So I had 10 minutes, 10-15 minutes on that really. Um, so Arts Council England, we're a non-departmental public body um, lots of you know us, we are there to fund arts and culture in England, um, doing your museums, your art galleries, your theatres, um, uh, libraries, museums, um, uh, anything live and arty and cultural, which you will be well aware of from the media, has been clobbered by the economic impact of COVID-19. We've got about 600-ish um, staff across nine offices. Um, before lockdown, people, uh, we were a very uh, mobile workforce. We had a lot of front facing people just out there in the field with, with arts organizations, working with them. Um, we had what was called a smart working project and it now feels like a relic of almost Victorian times. The days when we were trying to get people to work in more flexible, um, tech-focused ways. So pre-lockdown, we had this big working group 
and we were always trying to push it and it always felt quite often we were pushing against the tide um, and we had projects like reducing reliance on email and document duplication trying to address the meetings culture you know do we need can we have smarter shorter cuter meetings um, we had a kind of a, this nascent, more mobile thing, but we were tr still trying to coordinate it and f strike a balance between that and the meetings culture, pockets of presenteeist man management. Uh, at the same time, more and more people were starting to work from home in any case, but we were doing things like, let's write a policy to relax home working permissions a little bit more, that kind of thing. The good position is that we were quite well enabled with mobile tech at the point the shutters came down. We had staff issued with lots of smartphones and lots of laptops, but it wasn't, um, you know, hugely coordinated. We knew they were out there and we knew we had this big office base, which tended to be busier at the start of the week than it was at the end of the week. So what i'm going to express now is probably nothing extraordinary i think lots of you have been in this position but i think it's probably good to just talk and compare experiences and talk about where we can go forward now um nothing you know bizarrely unusual about our own experience in the arts council um when the government announced lockdown in march we we went with an immediate office closure um in retrospect it feels a lot easier to close offices than to reopen them. Um, the first thing we did is, you know, almost establish an inventory of who had the kit and who was able to work from home. And we were lucky because we're a knowledge working force. We're not, we were going out visiting, but we don't, we don't deliver a frontline um, face to face service. So we don't need people in a place necessarily to deliver that. And we discovered how true that was actually quite quickly. Um, so we established that the vast majority of our staff could work from home. And by, by vast majority, I did, do mean suddenly I could probably name the exceptions and put them on the fingers of one hand, really. Um, the other thing we didn't have to contend with you know, we're paid by the public port purse, we're funded through the taxpayer. We didn't have furloughs and redundancies to contend with um, because of, a, you know, many organisations losing commercial in income. Um, so as I said, lucky with our already issued high levels of laptops and mobile phones. Um, IT decision gave Microsoft Teams the monopoly for meetings. Part of the issue I had today, not used to using Zoom. Um, RITT don't like it. They, they think there's security issues with it. Don't want to go there. Um, but we're using MS Teams as a platform um, for the chat and for a, it's taken over a lot more document storage in the organization as well. But I'm not going to talk too much about the IT stuff. Um, what I will talk about is at that start of early lockdown, some of the things we did put into the role of sort of changes to our approach engagement policy is we um, addressed the roles where remote working wasn't possible. I mean, an interesting group who really got thrown out of joint. We had people running our estates, you know, nine offices plus an art storage. We had people on those. We found them alternative duties or we found workarounds for the teams that did need paper, which actually transpired was not many who needed paper to work. Um, I think a key one, and you'll all be aware of this, was first few months of lockdown, caring for dependents. Um, schools are closed. Um, you've possibly got people who are shielding living with you. We needed to make allowances for staff in that situation, which um, our workforce demographic, you would, we were probably talking that at least half of, of our staff base um, caring for either children or dependents in the house. And, you know, literally changing policy overnight to say, you, yes, balance your work with this. We understand. Um, we know there will be instances where you can't do a full working week. I think doing that at the outset got us huge brownie points and took a lot of stress off people. Um, we got lots of questions early on about sickness absence policy. 
Um, we took the decision of say treat like as if we needed to make a gigantic change for COVID. We treat it like any other absence policy. Best practice to me is to take every form of illness or condition people get on its own merits and and manage it accordingly. Um, so and then it didn't transpire into a terribly big issue because we locked down. We got people working from home early. In any case, we already had an employee assistance program. I'm sure lots of you do. We promoted that heavily. We were fortunate also that the start of lockdown coincided with our launch of a mental health first aider program from within our own staff base. Um, so that group of staff, we weren't sure how it was going to work, take off, has really, really taken off quite strongly as a, as a go-to by people here. Um, our office services team, we put them, gave them a lot of focus on the challenges of home ergonomics, the table, the chairs issues. Um, we worked through those. We gave people the HMSC um, statutory minimum £26 home working allowance. Lots of little micro policy tweaks like season ticket refunds enabling those. We made sure we were on top of those. We encouraged people to take annual leave. There was a big sense of why would we take annual leave? where we can't go away on a holiday anywhere and also we're needing to you've said we can juggle caring for these people with work but we still said no take a few days off away from work completely another big in innovation we did was well-being wednesday where we have a staff intranet and we tried to get people to create well-being solutions so lots of yoga classes i'm sure it was all part of the splurge of um, early lockdown online well-being initiatives, we added to those, um, added to them, tried to build on them as well um, with some bespoke um, mindfulness programs geared at our own staff um, and just a, bringing a lot of user content into there. I think one of the big innovations though is in terms of making us feel like we're one organization all pulling together was we instigated several oh, several of these a week um exec board dropping calls um where all staff would have a meeting with one of the five or six people often the ceo and just they had license to talk about anything and they're still going now um incredibly useful um, they've addressed a lot of the issues we had as an organization about a connectedness that we were struggling with before lockdown. So in some way, ways, it's helped us to go in the right direction, really. One other thing we've kept doing is we've kept surveying people. Um, again, we felt we entered into the lockdown period on the right foot because we were never commissioning external agencies to run our staff surveys anyway. We'd been survey monkey users for years and years and years going back um, and ran a series of really short, simple, what we call pulse surveys with, with staff colleagues. How happy are you with the situation? What more do you need? Those were the two questions we focused on in the early lockdown about, well, how's it going? What do you need from the technology? Is there any better ways we can do to make you feel more connected? We went, covered all those off through the core of lockdown. And actually between sort of April and July, we noticed that people were getting happier um, with the setup. Um, we'd worked through the initial niggles and questions. It had turned into a way of working we ourselves in our working roles had got through one round of emergency funding for the arts and culture sector, more of which later, and the mood was upbeat. We, we then started to ask people, as the lockdown conditions externally eased, well, what do you think about going back to the offices? Um, uh, it, it kind of grew. The vast majority were happy as it is. Um, Eventually, when we saw things easy enough, we started to prepare to reopen. We were positioned to reopen. It would have been a very, very COVID-safe environment. Um, in the end, 
when we entered a couple of weeks back what was clearly a second wave we rescinded the decision we we postponed it um it leaves us at an, an interesting point in our journey um looking at possibly a long winter of carrying on like this um what successes have we had so far we got people working from home very early we've I think we've had something like 15 or so staff reporting COVID symptoms, but no, but they weren't necessarily tested, no serious cases. And more, probably, possibly more importantly, sickness absence down anyway. I mean, obviously, those of you who are involved in this will know a working from home situation makes it easier to carry on if you've got that cold or flu that stops you from going in. But I think the genuine cases have fallen anyway. Um, an interesting thing I noticed is that, and this is maybe one for the conspiracy theorists who feel COVID was around before March or fe February, March, was um, we had a very, very high cold flu spike, our highest in the last five or six years in November, December and January. And that dropped when we went back into the offices. Um, Mental health first aiders, as I mentioned, have been a real success story. The exec board weekly drop-in calls where you get audiences of anything up to about 200 people um, are a success story. Um, the emergency funding, which, you know, there is a lot of staff concern, obviously, about the condition of the arts and culture sector. Um, we created a kind of a lend a hand scheme, a dad's army, because whilst we have a lot of colleagues who are sector facing and are in day to day contact with theatres, galleries, museums and whatnot, we have a lot of a head office staff who uh, really wanted to help. And we also, we, you know, we thought of ways to bring them on board to help with that. Um, so, as I said, looking forward, we were ready to reopen offices, but we knew we couldn't fit the same numbers of people in there that we could have done previously because of social distancing. Um, we didn't have a rush anyway. People were happy working from home. L looking forward, we probably need to think about changing our model. Um, the challenges we face going forward are it is a pause for thought as we complete the the emergency cultural recovery funds that we've been doing for the arts and culture sector that's occupied a lot of people's attention i think there'll be a pause then and think well what now um as i said there's this sense of another six months of working from home across winter people's attitudes to the social side of office working might change a bit more um I'm putting a very upbeat spin on our experience, but you know that we know there are, you know, lots of us who have our off days and um, it does create very, very different mental states being at home continuously, but it's very, very dependent on your own environment. We need to stay focused on that. We need to address what will might start to emerge as people's job security concerns if their workload drops off. Um, there's minority arguments starting to come through now about a sense that we should recompense people for ongoing homeworking by heating bills, broadband bills. I'm sure lots of you will have the view, well, actually, people are saving lots of money if they're not having to commute, so it balances out. But we still need to make these arguments and have some of these difficult conversations. And yes, the dealing with the general online ongoing zoom fatigue really um but lockdowns intensified um we feel we're functioning as an organization and in retrospect are surprised about how quickly we adapted to the home working situation the domination of life by screens um and probably the future is feeling a bit hybrid to us and i'm sure we might want to talk about that with other panelists and yourselves going forward now thank you very much for that ian uh, and for lee earlier and very happy uh, ian that you were able to join us again uh, we'll move on now to our third presentation from terry thanks mia 
Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit kind of hopefully kind of combining the two sides, the technology side and also kind of the, the human side, which is a much more important side, I'd say. So I'm the Chief Technology Officer at the UK Hydrographic Office, and I'm sure many of you have probably never heard of them. So what I'll do is a little bit about who we are first. So we, are, we work for UK government, of course, and we're basically the, the experts in marine geospatial data. Um, we source, process and provide marine geospatial data and services um, to a wide variety of people from government to defence and, and beyond commercial aspects as well. And that ranges from the seabed kind of all the way up the water column to the sea surface. Now, while we're part of the UK government, sitting under the Ministry of Defence, um, we're, we're also a trading fund. That means actually we have to be fully self-funding. We, we're based down in the southwest of, of the UK, about 850 people, and we generate revenue of about 150 million, about 30 million profit. So, you know, we've been around also for about 225 years. So we have quite a, quite a kind of a, a background. It's worth noting as well that we're a live operational organization. So 90% of ships globally use our products and services to navigate on, on a daily basis. So, you know, we have a lot of uh, things on the go at once, you could say. So what we might do is start with technology, a little bit about what we did, um, almost kind of the foresight of, of what was coming, and then kind of a bit through the lockdown, and then also how we've helped our, our staff and our people during these periods. So we were in quite a, you could say, lucky uh, situation, but uh, in essence, we, we fixed the, the roof while the sun was shining. Uh, with respect to our technology. So around two years ago, we moved into a new building. Um, so in, in essence, we built a, a, a brand new building in our old car park, all fully self-funded because we're a trading fund. And we took the opportunity that before we moved into that, that we do complete tech overhaul. So part of that was kind of new hardware, so new laptops, but also we made sure that there was new ways of working introduced at the same time around collaboration, actually taking the opportunity to change the culture of the organization and how it works. So what we did was before anyone could actually move over to the uh, new building, they had to go through this actual induction program where they got given their new laptop, they got told about the new ways of working, how the culture kind of wanted to be within that new building. And as part of that as well, when people slowly moved over over back a six week period or 850 of us, um, we set up the systems themselves, the tech systems, um, though even though you're actually physically in the office, the way they worked, it was effectively as if you were remote working. So everything actually went through the corporate VPN, as it would do kind of to an extent if you were working remotely. Um, so, you know, in essence, even though you're working in the building, you could be working remotely as well. And, you know, for staff, it, it just worked, which was great. Obviously, there was an awful lot of hard work going on behind the scenes by the technology teams. But this set us up in, in a very, very good position for when lockdown actually came about. So on to the start of lockdown for us as an organisation. We saw it coming probably um, about a week or so before full lockdown was announced. And we also, I think like a lot of us probably felt, well, this isn't really going to last. It's not going to last just a couple of weeks. This is probably for a fair chunk of time. So we had a think at the uh, executive leadership team about how we kind of want to um, enable people to best work from, from home. What do people need? Um, you know, whether that's laptop monitors and keyboards, all of that, of course, were, were in the office. But we kind of had to start to think that we need to put the needs of our staff first. We don't want everyone going home with just a laptop and hunching over a laptop, you know, for, for six months or so, or, or hopefully at the time we thought it'd be less, but, you know, a couple of months and getting bad backs and whatever else. So we actually sent out a pulse survey across the organisation and asked everybody, what, what, do you, what do you need to work home, work from home effectively? What kind of equipment do you need? And um, from this, we kind of reviewed the on-premise hardware that we have, and we actually went away and purchased extra monitors, a keyboard, and, and mice for a vast majority of staff. So actually, we have the ability to either be in the office with everything there and also work from home as well with all the setup and equipment you need as well. So when we went to work from home, um, you know, people left the office with their extra equipment, perhaps a monitor, a keyboard or a mouse, whatever else, and they got home then um, with this with this new equipment. And all the technology teams, um, they'd actually recorded videos of how to set this up, um, which everyone then used to set up their, their new gear at home. And I think that's really important. You can't just give technology to people and expect them to get on with it. You need to help people use it and understand how to use it. And I think this absolutely paid us dividends because the productivity of the organization didn't drop at all. And actually, in some areas, it went up. Um, you know, obviously, we're looking at investigating into why that that was. Um, 
so for me at the start personally for me at the start of lockdown it was very much about setting a routine putting breaks in my day so it wasn't back-to-back -back meetings because you know uh, as uh, Ian said there about kind of zoom fatigue or teams fatigue if you leave gaps in your calendars they have a habit of filling up with with meetings so it's always about kind of questioning do we need these meetings or not and instead I put kind of breaks throughout my day so I don't end up in back-to-back -back meetings and one thing I've also done is put call them squiffy meeting times so actually I put a meeting from 10 past 11 to 11:45 because you know the way these uh, systems tend to work is you'll get meetings on the hour so that then gives you some breathing space in between those um, certainly for me I made sure I had a nicer working environment as possible and you know I'm quite lucky that I have a spare room that I can work in I, I know that's not the case for for everyone one of the key things we did as well was actually communicating so I don't think in these situations any kind of leadership team can over communicate too much you've got to keep communicating keep talking to the teams and I think it's also about showing understanding that actually, you know, for a lot of us, this is actually pretty rubbish. For some people, like I say, this is the best time of their lives. They've been looking for this forever. But actually, as a leader, we've got to show as well that this is the same for us. You know, we all have bad days. This is not ideal by any stretch, you know, working from home in this manner. So what we did after a few months, we looked at doing a review of how things were working. So we sent out a poll survey to all staff. Oh, we were quite lucky that we actually had quite a high return rate on this. We wanted to find out what was working and what we could actually do better. And as part of this, we've got a, a cross-organizational team to, to go away and, and look at uh, the findings of this and kind of work out what actions we need to do. Now, the results and the results that we've had that around 90% of our people working remotely actually allows them to maintain a really good work-life balance. Um, but the challenges are, you know, so that's really good. However, 15% of our staff live actually alone and on their own and they're in forced isolation and that's something we need to bear in mind as well about how we help these people that's very much focusing on, on the well-being side of things and they've got some challenges about not just bumping into each other in the office kind of you know not having that serendipity of of conversation as you pass people and that's that's been a big challenge and kind of as ian mentioned there for the outcome outcome heart council and it's the same for us as well that our level of sick leave has actually gone down over, over the past six months and again, it's kind of interesting to try and work out why and what's going on behind that. Um, one thing I've always said kind of for, for myself and also for all my teams as well, is we need to try and get as good as possible at dividing home life and work life. So that's about getting that routine in there as well. And what we've actually found from over the past six months, that over 90% of people want to keep this increased flexibility in how we're working remotely. And, you know, I think we're pretty much now a hybrid working organization and I think that's kind of here to stay for us, um, but obviously we're reviewing that as we go along. So kind of, I think for us, it's very much probably less about remote working, more about flexible working, but elements of location where people are. And we have people based all over the country working. I think well-being is, is a really big factor of this and how we foster a kind of a sense of community, the interaction between people when they're based remotely, how you can kind of do that by a virtual kind of coffee drop-ins or, or things like that um, focusing very much on people's mental health and that's everyone's um, I think the culture for us is absolutely key so having that trust and leadership who understand actually we're all in this together it's like leadership aren't you know a special people who aren't having these tough times as well we're all in this together and I think for us actually focusing on very much being an outcome-based organization rather than a process-driven organization is absolutely, you know, it's worked dividends for us because people are focusing on what they need to do to get out the door as opposed to, I must be shown to be online from nine till five, otherwise I'll be in trouble. Very much focusing on being that outcome-based organization. Um, and again, working pattern-wise like Ian, you know, we've really encouraged people to take annual leave because even though we couldn't go away, I think taking that time off, covering your desk with a blanket or something perhaps so you can't directly see it and actually having some time away from your kind of mental office, I think, has been really, really important for people. Technology-wise, I said, things have worked very well for us. Um, some of the challenges have been, as Ian, sorry, kind of happened at the beginning, some people have had broadband issues, and the challenge around that is people often just blame the technology, or technology is not working for me, and actually, perhaps the tech solution has been working, but actually the broadband bit has been that, that weak, leak in, weak link in there. Communication-wise, again, like, like Ian was talking about, we've had and I do weekly drop-in sessions for anyone to drop in, have a chat with me. Also, as exec team, we do a live Q&A, regular live Q&As, where anyone can come and ask us questions. Um, and that's gone down very, very well for us. So kind of, in summary, 
lockdown kind of has enforced this new way of remote working for us. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, probably a year or so ago, many of us dreamed about being able to work from home, not having a commute, but this is certainly not what we envisioned it would be. Um, so what we need to do though is keep improving how, how we do things and how our teams work. You know, we've got a, a stretch coming up ahead of us now in, in the coming months that's going to be absolutely tough. And working remotely is not just about technology, it's actually about staying uh, sane and being productive. It's, it's about people, it's about all of us and how we cope through that and how we use technology to cope through that as well. So on that, I'm gonna hand back to, to Nia and see whether there's any questions at all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Terry, that's great. Um, so yes, okay, we've got time for some questions now. Um, just a reminder to the audience that if anyone would like to ask a question, um, you can click on the Q&A box at the foot of the Zoom window, type it in there. Um, I'll kick off with a few of my own. Um, and Lee, I might start with you. Um, I'm interested in understanding Dell's experience in the private sector experience of transitioning people to, to work from home. Um, you know, people may think you're Dell, um, staff must have had the technology and access to networks needed to enable them to work from home effectively. Um, but has there still been challenges to ensure that everything's streamlined and, and working as efficiently as it, as it could and what sort of teething problems have you had? Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, Dell actually started its um, remote uh, home working journey back in 2009. Um, and pre-COVID or pre the pandemic, we already had 25% of our global workforce, about 120,000 people, um, working remotely or in a, in a flexible fashion. Um, as part of that, it wasn't just from a technology point of view, but making sure we had the right um, HR systems in place from a connect, what we call the connected workplace. So for those uh, employees and staff that are working in remote locations, they've still got a, a community and a, an opportunity to collaborate as part of virtual teams in, in digital environment. Um, clearly, with the whole pandemic and the uh, move to everybody needing to work from home, uh, we had to massively accelerate um, the, the ability for all of our, our, our staff um, and employees to, to work remotely. Um, and Dell Digital um, needed a, a modern approach, which um, as as consumers of our own technology or drinking our own champagne, as I like to say, um, we implemented a, a wide area network globally that would enable us to handle mission critical workloads cost effectively and provide the right bandwidth for this growing internet traffic. Um, so what we actually saw as a result of already being on the journey to implement um, the um, software defined wide area networking technologies through um, powered by VMware, all of our factories, data centers, as well as our remote employees um, and our distribution hubs, uh, we were able to scale um, everybody in, in an increasingly um, efficient and accelerated way. Um, we still needed to get more of the devices and the, um, the endpoints to, to those customers, but the infrastructure um, was, was there in place. So it was a matter of then rolling out the devices and making sure we had an appropriate place for our employees and staff to, to work in that, that remote environment. And we, we've actually published some videos on DellTechnologies.com around remote work, which addresses and talks to the um, that whole transition and how we've not just addressed it from a technology point of view, but from a global facilities, a health and safety perspective. Um, so there's some great videos from Dell Technologies remote work around um, with our chief digital officer, our global facilities leads and our chief security officers going into a lot more of the, um, the operational side of how we've actually um, moved to this remote working environment and how we're anticipating to go back to a hybrid uh, approach post the pandemic. So also said we had about 25%. Um, Pre-pandemic, the view is that our, our office spaces will um, open at an appropriate time as per um, global and country um, health and safety allows, um, but then our employees will have the choice around this hybrid approach and we see the office spaces becoming more that of collaboration and meeting um, and our, 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 our staff will continue to have the option to work remotely as part of our Connected Workplace programme. Thank you for that. 
um, I've got a question for you, Terry, now. Um, you know, you mentioned that you were already in a pretty good um, position technology wise. Um, but what is the UK Hydrographic Office doing now in terms of making improvements um, as time goes on? Because clearly it will be probably uh, several months with people still working from home and you're thinking of moving to a more flexible model anyway. Um, so yeah, if you could sort of talk us through what needs to be to be done now and what, what other things you're, you're looking at, that would be, be great. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I kind of alluded to it in, 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 in my talk earlier around the fact that, you know, we've got to a certain point and we sent out a post survey kind of asking people what's working for you, what isn't working for you, what do we need to do better, how it has communication with the organisation, are you getting the messages you need, are you getting access to the people you need? Um, and we've got some, as I said, some really good responses on that. And rather than then that goes up to a, you know, a senior management team who then deal with it. What we've got is a, we've formed a, a cross-functional team of all grades across the whole organization from all areas to actually work on that. So you're making sure there's no one missed out. Um, you know, there's no area that isn't, hopefully doesn't have a voice heard in that respect. And, you know, if you can ask me what's on that listing, we've empowered our, our staff and our people to actually come up with what needs to be done to make their lives better rather than us decreeing what needs to be done. So actually, I'm waiting to find out myself as well what, what will be on that list. But I, you know, I think some of the challenges we've had is, is around, um, especially as you know, the past month or so, we've moved back to more of a kind of some people in the office, some people not in the office. How do we ensure that those people who aren't in the office aren't necessarily missing out on things? You know, those, as I said, those kind of serendipity, that com moments, those conversations in the corridor, or if you have a, a, a meeting where there's three people in the office and three people working remotely, do you say every one of those three people go to that same room? Or do you say actually, you know, in the office or do the three people go to different desks? So actually every single person in that meeting is separated. So there's not kind of other conversations happening in that room that other people can't take part on. So I think for us, it's how do we ensure that there's that inclusivity going forward? Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out actually suggestions on how that can be done. And actually maybe Ian might have some insight to that as well with what they're doing at the Arts Council. Ian, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, sorry, I, and I was just reading a, a very interesting question from Christina as well in the audience uh, from uh, the Ministry of Local Government in Modernisation in Norway, which actually seems to touch on the very same theme as well. Um, like um, Terry just said, um, I don't think there's a substitute for person-to-person -person discussion. Um, that can happen on a screen, that can happen on uh, a phone even. Phones seem to be forgotten on this. I think for, for short, short things, good old fashioned, um, talking to one another rather than insisting we look at one another is sometimes a good option. Um, we've all talked in our various presentations today, I think about the role of kind of bespoke resources, put a, you know, put a video up on this thing about well-being or put this document up. I know I burbled on about that in my presentation, but actually they're not substitutes in many occasions for person-to-person -person discussion. Um, and as, as, as Terry said, um, I think a lot of it about the, engendering the sense of togetherness is linking colleagues to directly to the people they need to talk to, which is why I think the um, exec board, all staff meetings we've been having a couple of times a week have been such a big success. Um, I think um, because people really do feel they can hear the messages straight down from the top, all those points of intermediaries are, are gone, the trust is there, it's really good. I think um, Terry also touched on the serendipitous corridor conversation, the water cooler moments, a lot of people, including people in my own organization, they feel they've been, been lost or are in trouble in this new virtual working environment. But, and I've had, I've had requests from colleagues saying, oh, and what tech should we use to make sure we can recreate this? And, you know, I'm not an IT person, but I'm not sure if this is a tech solution. And this is simply about, how humans use the tech that we already have. And to me, the best way to sort of 
make sure you re-establish those, as we say, the water cooler moments, the serendipitous conversations, is make your meetings little and often. I think people have instinctively done this anyway. People cannot hack several hours, day-long things on Zoom. But as an organization, probably like many of yourselves, we were perfectly content pre-lockdown to have a five-hour meeting. They're gone now. We don't have them now. Um, we, I, I, when I just think about my own HR team, we used to have a day-long monthly meeting. Um, it's now replaced by twice weekly, one hour between all of us. Um, I think we find out much more. We get decisions made much more quickly. We exchange information much more fre frequently. Uh, I think another thing I would say for your meetings is let, and I've learned this late, late on, let the chat function blossom. Um, just allow people to throw in these asides because it's hard in these short, tighter meetings to make sure everyone get, gets a chance to speak. And not everyone always wants to do the public performance thing. Um, use that chat box um, and pick up everything in it because actually I think a lot of the water cooler moments do come through on the chat box. So thoughts off the top of my head on that one. Thanks Ian. I want to um, stick with you for the next question. Um, you mentioned in your presentation relieving stress um, and as we all know the art sector has been on its knees since lockdown began and presumably that's meant not taking demand for Arts Council England funding and support. How have employees risen to the challenge of dealing with additional inquiries while adapting to working remotely? And what have you done, are you and your team done um, to manage stress levels? Um, I mean, clearly sort of reducing meeting times is one thing, um, but perhaps you could talk us through some other measures. Um, I think it's maybe a bit of an overgeneralization to say that all of our colleagues in the sector facing roles have been swamped um, because some organizations have gone very quiet it's it's been very definitely more of a matter of peaks and troughs i would say and actually some of the stress management we've maybe had to do has been actually the actual managing of the downtime the quiet periods the the, the periods when your phone isn't ringing and you start to fear the worst from those organizations you're not hearing about. And you start to worry, I think, like anybody whose job goes really, really quiet about your own future. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to say it's been a continual firefight that we've had to manage. At the moment, we are in the middle of that, but it's kind of something where we've got background in because every three years we do this triennial funding agreement anyway with the, the whole arts and culture sector so this is kind of the equivalent of that for us at the moment so in terms of sort of generally managing the stress it's it has I think been more about managing the change conditions we're in and it's difficult to generalize because everyone has a different experience that there, there are people who are nat naturally quite happy with it the situation your life is now more screen based there are more people more extroverted who really really miss that human contact and i think it's back to those things i was talking about a minute ago is that i think it's a responsibility to create conditions where that sense of contact remains and things don't get missed and people's feelings and thoughts don't get missed and i ha i'm th i'm thinking reflecting that i haven't taught about the important roles of blind managers in that. You know, I don't want to give the impression the Arts Council is this big top-down thing where everyone's really happy if they can sit and listen to exec board for an hour a week. It isn't like that. Day-to-day um, -day contact with your peers in your team and your line manager is absolutely essential here. Thanks, Ian. Um, Lee, I'll come back to you um, now on the tech side. Um, I wondered what you'd learned from your public sector clients about how they've adapted to new ways of working. Um, you know, in the tech side, what have they struggled with most? Is it that home broadband connectivity um, or are there other things and, and what sort of technology gripes 
um, is most likely to be detrimental to people's well-being, do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. So in terms of the kind of the range of technologies we spoke about earlier, I think very rapidly um, organisations across the public sector and all sectors managed to get the right devices and endpoints um, to the to the, the uh, end users, to the, to the staff, um, and that gave them the basic levels of access. Um, some of the areas that we've now seen them, um, our customers more challenged with is as the uh, amount of connectivity into the remote services increases, how to ensure a consistent security policies and postures for all of those applications um, outside of the, the traditional workplace. Um, and the approach that we're now talking to our, our, our customers about is one of intrinsic security. So whereas traditionally um, security was very much seen as a bolt on, so we need to add in some security devices to make sure that there, no threats get into the organization, um, security is actually becoming much more top of mind for, in a lot of conversations to make sure it's being um, built in from the ground up. Now, this obviously started years ago and it's become um, much higher um, principle as part of the GDPR um, programs most organizations have rolled out, but extending that beyond the normal walls of the, the, the corporate environment has, has added additional um, requirements in there. So we're looking at this whole intrinsic security message with our customers at the moment around how we make sure it's, it's built in all components of the architecture. And that just doesn't include the, the infrastructure and the devices, but also from a policy and a process point of view. So we can make sure that um, as our staff are accessing the important sensitive data is done in a compliant and secure fashion. Um, so absolutely, it's something which has become, um, if it wasn't already, top of the um, dialogue um, we're having with many of our customers across all segments, including, including the public sector. Thank you. And that feeds on to um, a next question to uh, Terry on the, on the data security side. Um, security is a big priority for, for your office. Uh, how, are you, how are you managing that when people are working remotely, perhaps with sensitive information? Yeah, I think that's a, that is, a, is a, certainly a challenge for, for us. Um, there's obviously elements of what we do working for the Ministry of Defence is kind of in, in the top secret area. And there has been, you know, during, even during lockdown, uh, we made sure that actually the organisation, the building, physical building, was COVID safe and secure. And there were some people who had to stay in the office because of the work they were doing. So that kind of level of security was always done within a, a maintained kind of unit, which we knew was completely secure. Anyone working from home, you know, we've had, we had some people saying like, well, can, can, you know, what, can we have printers to start printing stuff out? And actually it's one of those things that you think, well, actually, why do you need to print things out to an extent? You've, you've had to kind of, you know, we've, we kind of jumped in the past six months, you know, kind of almost like a decade on to this almost paperless office. I mean, sure, we all scribble notes down and stuff, but you are still maintained within, within your house. You have to be careful about what you do and what, what you talk about. But of course, you know, in the technology area as well, we have a, a, a lot of um, younger people in there who perhaps even shared houses as well, who perhaps don't have rooms they can work in on their own. So you need to bear that in mind as well. And it's about making sure that you have the right processes in place and the right level of security, I suppose, for whatever they are, what level they're, they're working at. I mean, one thing we have seen actually is um, with, there's better understanding now across the organisation. We've done quite a bit of education, certainly over the last year or so, around things like um, phishing, I suppose, you know, so basically people sending spam emails, pretending to be something else and people, you know, clicking on that and then losing data in that way. And actually we found that the, the, the staff have been getting much, much more aware of this in, in the past six, eight months or so even so much that actually we recently launched a, a new staff benefit system and the email went out to all staff and there was a, a high number of people that said this this doesn't look right this looks like spam this looks like you know they're going to get my data somehow so it's really good actually to see you know people challenging that um so for us it's very much kind of around the, the education piece and actually making sure that people are aware of, of where these challenges may come and again it's just trusting people to to be able to do things in, in the best way possible so I've just saw, seen a question come up from um, John uh, Wilmot French. Did you want me to take a, a first approach at that one? Yeah, sure, go for it. So just in, term, in terms of looking at um, what the future of work could look like, we, so we've actually done some work and we continue to do work around um, 
transforming the future of work and we call it a, a vision for 2030. Um, and really this is looking at how emerging technologies are enabling people and communities across the globe to pursue um, and sustain themselves with more creative, mean, meaningful uh, and equitable ways of working. Um, so the research basically cites three key shifts that we believe will usher in a more inclusive and rewarding work experience, um, leveraging technology over the next decade. Um, this includes the human element in terms of inclusive talent, so human-machine partnerships will make it possible to find and match people's unique capabilities um, with work requirements, giving access to a global talent pool, um, empowered workers, and how real-time and immersive collaboration technologies will empower workers across the world to work in a more augmented or, or virtual world, um, and AI fluency, so a deep understanding of our artificial intelligence will unlock um, the human potential um, and set workers apart. So uh, today we've really spoke around the technologies that are being deployed now to address this challenge, but absolutely we have our whole storyboard around uh, how we view the transformation of the future of work by 2030. Uh, and we'll be talking a lot more about that at the Dell Technologies World event I alluded to coming up later this month. Thank you, Terry, would you like to come in on that one? Yeah, I think I think looking at that kind of the kind of the technology of the future or the office of the future, I think the the organization, be it be it, you know, led by Elon Musk or, or Dell or whoever else, I think the ones that will be successful will be the ones that put people at the heart of it. So what do we do? We know what does this technology enable our people to do rather than we have this great technology and actually what do we do with it? Twist it around the other way. So, you know, for me, it's basically that's the digital piece isn't it digital is about how people use technology to effectively do their jobs in a better way an easier way and i think that's where the real success for any company will come is if they focus on the people and actually how we can improve people's well-being their lives and how they can be much more productive in a good way so you know not that they can do more work but actually they can do better high high value work and actually finish work earlier perhaps even you know focus on that outcome based approach and, and yes, similarly, um, sorry if I gave this impression, I don't hanker for, in, at least in the working environment, uh, I'm, I, I'm not disconsolate for a return to pre-lockdown pre days. Um, what does make me sad about COVID from the perspective of my own work uh, is the impact it's had on the arts and culture sector in the, in the, um, in the country. If we as an organisation can survive that existential crisis, um, I think there are lots of opportunities in the future for us in terms of the way we work. Um, and we are most definitely at a fork in the road. Um, I don't underestimate the challenges of it, um, but I do see the opportunities are there. And I think the future does seem to be about striking a balance between more virtual working, but at the same time, enabling people to come together um you know we've talked about a hybrid model where maybe people move more to dropping in the offices one or two days a week um that will influence lots of things going forward and i, th I think that's where the action's at thank you for answering that that audience question there um we've got five or so minutes left so i reckon we could probably fit in a couple more questions. Um, Ian and Terry, coming to you, um, you know, what key lessons have you learned since the start of the pandemic about the way the Arts Council England and the UK Hydrographic Office operate and what you've been able to achieve? Maybe I'll jump in first, Ian, before you. Um, so so from, from us, what I have realised actually is, as an organisation, we have a great sense of community of actually looking out for each other and looking you know after each other um and and that's kind of it's very heartening and very warming to, to see that as i said kind of you know we have our teams and the teams are looking out for each other whether that's that kind of trying to replicate that coffee sorry the the kind of water cooler moment by having those drop-in sessions every morning so you can just do one if you want have a chat leave whatever else but i think for us it's kind of very much the case of seeing the the team ethos and actually the culture that we've been working hard to create across the organization for the past number of years, really coming to, kind of coming to the front and actually showing how 
together and committed we are as an organization to making sure firstly that we're all okay but secondly actually that we can do our jobs effectively to give the outcomes that we need so it's it's, it's actually for for me i mean and we've all been through some challenging times over the past six months and there will be more to come but i think for us that the, the fact that we're all looking out for each other is is heartwarming i suppose in that respect Ian, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, it, it came as a genuinely pleasant surprise how well we adapted to a new way of working, um, working from home using Teams. Um, and I think the learning is make sure you stay together, you work closely together and have the channels to do that at all levels top level involve your middle management and enjoy and, and, and involve the whole team really um the, the the conversation needs to be kept going people need to i think see each other and talk to one another through whatever is the most effective means posting up a load of videos of yoga or whatever is not going to do the job in itself uh, i think rely on your own internal resources and know-how uh, because you are the best you are the experts in in your own organization um and also everyone's different um we know that some people have a bespoke room in their house where they can work we know i know people who are you know doing it you know working in bed working in closets working on ironing boards um everyone's situation is different and we need to be aware of that and mindful of that. Yeah, I'd also add as well the fact that for us, um, I think that insight you're kind of alluding to there into people's private lives has made the organization much more open. So yeah. we have this kind of this secret top level of management who are kind of living big stately manners somewhere or whatever else actually, you can see that they are just human. They've got their kids behind them having a nerf fight or something going on. They're trying to, they're shouting at them while trying to do a meeting or whatever else. So every, you know, I think it's opened up this massive kind of humanity in there as well. And actually it's made things, people appear more vulnerable, which I think is, is not a bad thing. Yeah. Our CEO, CEO is now notorious for running off to collect Amazon deliveries mid, mid call. And Lee, I don't know if you want to, um, to answer that question from, uh, from Dell's perspective and experience. No, uh, absolutely. So, uh, so to the extent we had a, uh, a, a a CEO a bedtime reading. So Michael Dow actually doing a virtual Zoom reading, a bedtime story to all, all of the children because uh, it was often we're doing meetings like this. And like I said, they come back from school and pop up in the background. Um, so to see from the very top and Michael doing the, the bedtime reading for, for, for the children, it's not something that you have the opportunity to do in a traditional work environment. So that was, uh, that, that, that was great. Uh, and we, we, we have what we call tell Dow uh, employee survey and 90 more than 95 percent of all of our staff members uh, are, are very positive about remote working envi uh, environment um I'm talking about environment there's massive environmental benefits as well so uh, since we started our, our remote working journey we've actually um tracked that we saved an estimated 42 million kilowatts of energy through um through the remote working um and also the co2 um, emission saved the fact that people are not driving backwards and forwards to the offices so there's team member benefits, there's environmental benefits. So I definitely think that we will be looking at a new normal um, and this hybrid approach as we, as we go forwards. All right, thank you. I reckon we can squeeze in one last very quick question. Um, this one's to all of you, and if you could perhaps keep your answers to 30 seconds or so, that would be really great. Um, you perhaps touched on this in the future of homework um, question. Um, but of the working practice changes that have been introduced and adopted over the last six months, which ones do you think are likely to become permanent? Who's jumping in? Who's jumping in? Ian. I'll go first. Yeah, um, a few, a few actually. As I said, I, I can see um, homeworking becoming the norm rather than the exception. Um, I can see um, a much smarter use of meeting time 
um, where it's not about bringing a lot of people together in exactly the same room for several hours. Uh, and I can see, I think, as Terry talked about earlier, um, greater flexibility around working hours. I think at least on paper, we've still got our staff working a Monday to Friday, nine to five. I know that's not the reality and particularly wasn't the reality of things when people had kids to look after when the schools were shut. Um, as I said, that's on paper at the moment. At some point, the policy will change, I would have thought, to reflect that reality. Yeah, and I, I think I think for us, you know, again, kind of we talk about remote working for us, uh, as Ian was saying there, it's about flexible working. And I don't think, you know, while, you know, we, before we came into this, the vast majority of our staff believed that they had flexible working anyway, you know, that we were, that that's the kind of culture that we had. And I don't think we're ever going to go back to a, an era where we expect everyone to be in the office nine to five to go down there and at five o'clock, you know, like Flintstones, everybody leaves. I don't. I think those days for us and for the vast majority of companies are, are long gone. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and as we said previously, I think uh, the remote working, the flexibility has always been one of the top um, three as part of the Dell culture code, along with ethics and inclusion. Um, and I think it's just going to help increase uh, productivity through the, the, the further use of these emerging technologies that we've been speaking about um, and a better balance. So I, for one, have never had so many family dinners with my, my children, which I, I think is a great thing. Um, and if we can be as productive and as through um, um, the meeting management and the points that Ian and Terry have spoken about, I think that's driving human progress if we can be productive and have a better work-life balance that's a good outcome for our employees um, our staff and ultimately our customers as well i think also just thinking about that as well i think the challenge of course is the blurring of lines and that's something we need to be really careful of home working and actually being at home making sure that you don't work from seven in the evening till nine in the evening and things like that actually you can draw fairly strict lines i think that's something we'll be focusing on as well helping our staff do that all right well thank you very much we are out of time um, so thank you to Lee and to Dell Technologies, to Ian and to Terry, and of course to you, the audience. Um, we really hope you found the, the webinar insightful. Uh, we'll be emailing you all with a link to the recording um, of the webinar and a write-up outlining the main points as well, uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks, Bye. Bye.